see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in life, bursting in living color, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. Have you ever seen the Hello. Hello! Good morning. It is great to have you with us at Hope at Home. My name is Michael, this is Suzanne, and uh, we are on the team here at Hope Church, and we're so glad that you can join us for worship yeah. this morning. Well, yeah, and I'd just love to share a scripture with us all, actually. This was something I was reading this morning, and it really just stirred my spirit for us as a church, for us as individuals, for the borders, and it's Psalm 66, and this is what it says. It says, shout for joy, all the earth, sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious, yeah. say to God, how awesome are your deeds, and mm. it goes on further down, come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind, praise our God, all peoples, that's us, let the sound of his praise be heard, he has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping, Come and hear, all you who fear God, let me tell you what he has done for me. And God has surely listened and he has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. And I just absolutely love that psalm. Mm. It really stirred my spirit this morning. And I just felt it was something I wanted to share with you that we are called to give thanks at all times. We're called to praise Jesus, mm. whether that's through song or just with our lives in our everyday. Yeah. And we're called to mm. testify of his goodness to each other and to the world out yeah. there. And it really connects with what we've been praying with, praying for this week as part of our prayers in November, Michael was saying, wouldn't it be amazing if people would just stop and say, come and see what God is doing. Mm. And that, that's our heart. So we're going to worship and I think you're going to pray for us as we just go in and, and kind of from the outset say, we declare that you are God and we choose to worship you in the name of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. We're here to worship Jesus. Let's pray together. Yeah. Lord Jesus, we, we come to you. We're just in awe of who you are of all that you've done for us. We, mm. we are blessed, Lord. We are blessed. We could so easily look at all that's happening around us, but we want to fix our gaze. Mm. We want to fix our eyes on you. We want to fix our spiritual eyes on you this morning. And we just welcome you, King Jesus, into our midst. We welcome you, King Jesus. You've said that when we're gathered, you will be there. Mm. That is your promise. And Lord, we, um, we want to do warfare this morning. We just stand and declare to the heavenlies that, Lord, this is your time. This is your place. And, Lord, we just hand over our lives to you afresh. We just say, come and fill us. Come and renew us, Lord. You, those words tell us, remind us that there's joy, there's delight mm -hmm. in worshipping you. And that is where our utmost joy and delight is found. So we take delight in you this morning, Lord God. And here we are to worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And as we worship together now, we're just going to use some songs to, to worship and declare mm -hmm. the greatness of Jesus, of our great God. What, let, let's not spectate. Let's not just lie back on the sofa. Um, let's, let's even, if we have to, change our posture physically, and maybe it's appropriate to stand, but let's, let's just give this time over to him, and let's worship and declare how good he is, and let's, with thankful hearts, just come before him and sing right now. Mm, amen. You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory and creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is 
nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great, your love was greater what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again and you have no no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. It's always good to praise, to mm. worship together, and we love being able to do that through song. Well, this month, of course, we're calling it Movember, and we're encouraging all of us to just press in a little bit more and spend some time praying. And we've already had some good feedback. Mm -hmm. I think it's, people are encouraged again that, that, that God is speaking to us and challenging us and just wants to move among us. Yeah, and have you 
signed up? Yes, I, so I had my signed up. I had my prayer slot earlier this week, and um, it's so good, isn't it? It's always encouraging to just spend that extra bit of time in prayer. And let me encourage you, there, there are, you can sign up. We've given you uh, information about how you do that. And it's not for us to get hung up on. Mm. This is just a way for us saying, I'm going, just going to mark that day, yeah. and, and that's my time. And if we all did that through this month, then, then, then God is taking the prayers of many mm -hmm. over this month. Yeah. And I believe that's going to be mm -hmm. significant for us. Yeah. We always end up sitting on the, the same sides, don't we? We when do. We present this. We do. And funny enough, just this morning, we actually thought, oh, let's switch. But it was just, it went all wrong. We couldn't do it. So we're creatures of habit and we're sticking to this position. Yeah, what a, what a pioneering <laughs> church we are, all ready for, for change. And here we are sitting oh, in our same seat in the same... A little bit like church, isn't it? We sit in our same seats. <laughs> yes. We have to change that. But anyway... Yes, so um, I'm excited about Sundays. Yes, um, I am very excited about Sundays. <laughs> we are so excited to be getting back to in-person services, aren't we? Yes. And you are going to be receiving an email from us with all the information that you need for that. So there's no need to worry. We will accommodate you in some form and all the information will be on that email so we will get that to you soon but we start on the 22nd of november next sunday not far off at all yeah and it's going to be different to how we knew sunday gatherings before but it's going to be so great to be able to come together um, and worship god in this way so we are so excited yes, we are. for that um shall we talk about money Let's talk about money. You know, when we talk about money in church, it does not need to be awkward. No. It's a healthy thing to talk about money. So yeah. why don't you speak to us about money? Yeah, well, of course, Jesus talks a lot about money. Money features a lot in the Bible because when Jesus taught on money, what he was saying was money is linked to our heart. Mm. You know, where, where our heart is, uh, where our treasure is, that, that's where our heart is. And, 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 so, and so we give money and, it, and it's birthed out of, where our heart is. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, just want to explain, um, some of you may, may not be too familiar with this, but, but the way church functions, the way a New Testament church functions is that, is that people who are part of that gathering, part of that church family, give money. They sacrificially give money. Um, and it's all to do with the generosity of God. God has mm -hmm. been so generous to us and we reflect his grace, his heart to us, and we generously give of our money into the life of the church. So that's how it sourced, that's how it's funded, that's how it works, and we just want to be really practical about that. That is the teaching of the New Testament. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 8, he, he commends the Macedonian churches. He says, you've, you've excelled in this grace of giving. You've, you've given um, out of excellent generosity. So yes, if you are part of the Hope family, if you're with us regularly and you would like to give, we are going to show you some details how, how you can give online. But remember, you can send a cheque as well. It doesn't have to be online giving. So we'll just show you those details now. Just want to take this opportunity and say thank you because there are many, many people that generously, mm. sacrificially give into the life of Hope Church. And um, we just want to say a huge thank you yes. to you. And speaking of money, you want to talk to us about Christmas hampers? Yes, I do. You'll have heard us speak about this um, previously um, last week. But I just want to remind you guys, if you didn't hear that, we have a Christmas initiative, Christmas hampers. We love Christmas, don't we? And I know yeah. lots of you love Christmas as well. And obviously, in a normal year, we would open up Hope Central. We'd have it full of people. We'd give them a gorgeous Christmas dinner, thanks to our amazing teams that do that. Mm. But obviously, this year, we can't do that. And we don't want to just forget those people. We want to give them a reminder that they, that they are loved, that we are thinking about them. So we are just appealing today to, to say if this is something that you're 
heart is drawn to, would you um, think about donating some money to our Christmas hamper appeal and we will turn that money into a beautiful gift, a practical gift, a helpful gift to people who are on their own this Christmas with lots of love from Hope Church Borders. So if you want to be part of that, please send your money and we are ready to go shopping. If you are a regular online giver, if you pop the money into the account and just reference it, Hampers, and our finance team will know that that's what it's for. So excited about that. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's a fantastic way that we can serve and we can all be involved together. Yeah. Well, we're going to preach. I would love to just pray before we look at God's word together. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing among us. We thank you that you've given us your living word, mm -hmm. that it's living and active, you tell us, Lord. And I pray that you would come and take that living word and speak through me today and you would just really do something in our hearts mm -hmm. and in our lives and build us as your people through your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So I want to read Daniel chapter 5. We're back in the book of Daniel again this week. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that they had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and a gold chain placed around his neck. And he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in. They could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians and enchanters and astrologers and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read the writing on the wall and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the Most High God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to, he put to death. He put to death those he wanted and those to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, 
he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets them above anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all this, instead you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Many, many, tekel, parson. Here is what these words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple and a gold chain placed around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the writing is on the wall. An ominous warning. Something's going to happen. You, we may use the phrase, a, a business that perhaps goes bankrupt, and people will say, but the writing was on the wall. Things were not going well. This is where this phrase, the writing is on the wall, comes from. Daniel chapter 5. Now, context. Last time in Daniel chapter 4, we saw King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, how he was humbled for a time. But then he looked to God and was restored and, and he worshipped God and God was worshipped in Babylon. But not anymore. Things have changed in this chapter. In 1854, John George Taylor, an archaeologist and an emissary to the British Museum, um, undertook excavations in ancient Babylon. And what they discovered were these cylinders which dated back over 2,300 years. And they had parchment, they had text of historical recording of events in Babylon. And historians were greatly excited by this because what these texts did was marry up biblical text with real events. And they were able to piece some bits of the puzzle together. It makes sense of which king was ruling at which stage of Babylon. So what's happening here in Daniel chapter 5? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for 23 years. That means there's something like 70 years since Daniel and God's people have been deported from Israel, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Daniel would have now been in his 80s, a more elderly man. Nabonidus is the fourth king since King Nebuchadnezzar. And what has happened, he has left the city on royal business. And what he's done is left his son, Belshazzar, who we see in this chapter, he's left him in temporary charge of the city. Now, when the text says that King Nebuchadnezzar was his father, what it's meaning is ancestor. We also need to know that at this point in history, the Persian army had been trying to assault the city of Babylon unsuccessfully for some time. So, so that's our backdrop. That's the context to the story here. And here we meet Belshazzar, this young stand-in king. He doesn't seem too concerned about this imminent threat from the Persians. 
he's probably thinking something like, they could never conquer the Babylonians. We're too strong for them. We're too powerful for them. And so he's so unconcerned that rather than give orders about defending the city, he gives orders to throw a huge party. He's upholding the calendar tradition of holding a feast in recognition of their pagan gods. And so the best Babylonian wines are served. And it says that the nobles and their wives and their concubines parted together. Let me interpret It's a drunken orgy. That is what is going on here. And so the wine flows. And Belshazzar, the party host, decides that he's going to show off to his guests. And things get a bit sacrilegious. Here's what happens in verse 2. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So 70 years before, When King Nebuchadnezzar had sieged the city of Jerusalem, he ransacked the temple and took these artifacts that were used in the worship of God from the temple and took them as treasure that he then carried back to Babylon. And so here, this party has accessed these artifacts from the temple. It's an act of mockery. It's a pagan celebration. And he pours his wine into these cups, these vessels that have been used for divine worship of God in his holy temple in Jerusalem. Verse 4. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. Takes the cup that was previously used as an offering to God and arrogantly makes a toast to his pagan gods, the gods of gold and silver and bronze and wood and stone. And the writer is making it clear. These gods are nothing less than powerless, worthless idols. So picture it. Here is Belshazzar gripping this goblet this vessel, if you like, this sacred cup, demonstrating that he is the one who has power over the kingdoms of the earth. A toast to our gods. No one can stand in our way. We are Babylon the great. He has a firm grip over Israel, over God's people, over Yahweh, over God. Or so he thinks, because suddenly, Everything changes. I'm sure that you've heard of the street artist Banksy, who seems to mysteriously appear at night in particularly places like London, and he will do graffiti art on walls, and uh, people will discover it that the next day there's this amazing art piece has, uh, has appeared. Like graffiti art like this one right here. And here we see graffiti art of a different kind. Graffiti, writing, appears on, on, on the wall of the palace. Only this time it's terrifying because King Belshazzar watches a human hand supernaturally writing on his wall. And he has no idea what this writing means. And he's not so arrogant now. He sobers up and terrified. He's saying, well, what does this mean? What, what does this text say? And I think Rembrandt in his painting, Belshazzar's Feast, um, kind of captures this moment well. In desperation, The king has to know, what does this graffiti mean? What is being communicated to me? And the recurring theme that we see through Daniel is the astrologers and the diviners and the magicians and their black arts, they're impotent. 
They cannot interpret this because it's a message from God. The Queen Mother comes to the rescue, reminding the king of Daniel and his reputation. And so Daniel is sent for. And we see this huge difference between this young king and Daniel. The difference is striking. Here is a foolish, intoxicated, arrogant young ruler. And here is Daniel, the wise, mature man who is just oozing with God's wisdom. And so this young ruler is trying to hold on to some control and he offers some meaningless position if Daniel is able to interpret this writing on the wall. But Daniel's no fool. He knows that this puppet king is being ignorant of the fact that even as he's saying this, Babylon the Great is falling into different hands. Their power is slipping away. And he, so he has no time for his empty promises of prestige and power. And here Daniel speaks as an older, wiser man. Have you not learnt, King Belshazzar, from history? Do you not know your heritage? Your great, great, great grandfather was the greatest, most influential leader in the world. And God humbled him for a time until he recognized who God is and he worshipped God. And we see here a righteous anger rising up in Daniel. Twice he says, and you, Belshazzar, and you, Belshazzar, you have not learned. Here you are, the one that has dared to grip the cup that belongs for worship to God, and you pour in your own wine. And this text, this writing on the wall, is of course Aramaic. And here is what Daniel says the words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Numbered, numbered, weighed divided. From the beginning of time, weights and measures as a symbolism have been used to represent justice on the earth, a weighing up, a weighing up of the truth and the facts and what is right. Law courts, our law courts, depict uh, an image of Lady Justice, the Greek goddess Theus, who has scales on one hand and a sword in the other. And Daniel's saying to the king, you have made a big mistake, Belshazzar. God has weighed you up and his justice is being delivered. The writing is on the wall. And that very night, Babylon the Great fell to the Medes and Persians. And this is interesting. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote about these events. And what he tells us is that the Persians cleverly dammed the river Euphrates, which ran through the city of Babylon. And what they did was ford the river at its entry and exit points from the city, where it was less defended, and their army was able to go into the city, and they conquered Babylon that very night. And in that battle, King Belshazzar was killed. God will not be mocked. This is what Daniel said to him. Verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. So where do we go with this? What do we do with this text in 20? 20. Well, this is so much more than just a historical account. These are the eternal living words of God. You see, what it's getting at is this is the story of humanity. This is our story. It's revealing the nature of the human heart. 
Romans 1 says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. The heart, Scripture reminds us, is deceptive above all things. You see, we've all done a Belshazzar. We've all taken the cup, if you like. We've taken our own life, which belongs to God and is held by him, and we've poured in our own wine. We've tried to live life on our terms, our way, without God. Romans 14 says, As surely as I live, this is God saying this, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. The writing is on the wall. Jesus will return to this earth and every person in the world will acknowledge that he is God. But we have two options. Either he returns and we are ready because we have repented and put our faith in him and acknowledged and worshipped him as God or we're not ready. And that day will be the most terrible day for those who are not. Because then we enter an eternity without God. Let me ask you, please hear my heart. What about you? Are you right with God? Have you repented and turned from your way of doing life and allowed God in? Because you can. You see, there's another cup and another king, King Jesus. And I want you to imagine the scene just before his crucifixion, the night before, and Jesus knows what he's going to be facing. And we see him in anguish. He's in turmoil. In fact, he's so stressed that the blood vessels in his face are bursting. He literally sweats drops of blood as he prays out of agony to his father. And he says, Lord, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. What's the cup? It's the cup of God's wrath. It's the cup of judgment. It's our sin, our sinfulness. You see, the writing is on the wall. We've been found wanting. God reminds us in Isaiah, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've gone our own way. We've lived our lives without him. And our lives do not measure up to the holy standard of God. But you see, Jesus didn't end his prayer there. Because he said, not my will, but yours, Father. And he went to the cross for you and for me. And there he takes the punishment, the wrath, the judgment that should fall on us. He drank that cup for us. And he did it out of love. And on the cross, that hideous place is where suffering and mercy and justice and love meet in this beautiful collision and what is hideous becomes beautiful. Because Jesus did that for us. But you know, he didn't stay on the cross. He rose again. He is alive today. And he offers us the gift of new eternal life. And so we all need to repent, turn from our life and our way of doing this and turn to God, recognizing that there is a gift of salvation, that he has done it all for us and we put our faith in him. That is why the Bible repeatedly calls it, it's good news, it's good news. Have you responded to this good news? And you see what he does is take our lives when we put our faith in Jesus And he pours in his own wine, so to speak, the life of his spirit. And we are made new and righteous and complete. And we can live life equipped with the very life of Jesus. We're made new from the inside out. You know, maybe today that you're already a follower of Jesus. You know Jesus, but there's a challenge for us here in this too. Have we done a Belshazzar? Do we not at times raise a toast to our own gods? Are there perhaps idols in our life 
things that are more important to us than Jesus? Are we perhaps doing things our own way? Are we thinking like Belshazzar that we have a firm grip on our life and our way of doing it? Are we holding on to our own ways, our own plans for the future, our own sin? What is truly important to us in life? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, then you need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You see, there's things that we need to let go of. Jesus must be first. And maybe Jesus is whispering to us today, son, daughter, I I love you too much to leave those things in place in your life because they're getting in the way of your relationship with me. Maybe it's time to let go of some things, to stop pouring in our own wine and allow Jesus to pour in the wine of his spirit and fill us afresh. How will you respond to this message here today? Are you holding on to things? Are the things that you need to let go of and put Jesus first? And I would love us to respond right now. I'm just going to simply give us a moment in the quietness of wherever you are in your own heart to respond to that challenge. Maybe the challenge for you is you've never put your life right with God. And maybe you recognize today actually the writing's on the wall. That it's time for me to repent and turn from my life and put my faith and trust in Jesus and accept this beautiful, amazing offer, this gift of salvation and new life in Him. And if that's you, I would love to lead you in how you can do that. And it's simply a prayer. So why don't you pray in your heart with me? Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are God. I humble myself today. I recognize that I haven't lived for you. I haven't worshiped you. But I recognize today that this isn't working, going my way. And so today I choose to become a worshiper of you. I repent. I turn away from doing life on my terms, my ways, holding on to my sin. And I put my faith and trust in you, Jesus, recognizing that you died on that cross for me, that there you took my sin, my pain, the judgment, the wrath that should fall on me. Jesus, thank you for your finished work. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And by placing my faith in you, I trust you for this gift of new life. And I say, come and fill me with your Holy Spirit, that Jesus, you would live in me and through me, that I would follow you the rest of my days, empowered and equipped to be a worshiper of Jesus. I'm made right with God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. What a wonderful, amazing response that you have made. What a wonderful, amazing thing that God offers us this. Let me encourage you this morning. I'm cheering you on. And maybe if you have prayed that prayer today and you're starting a new relationship with Jesus, please get in touch with us because we would love to help you on your way. But I trust that encourages you. I hope that blesses you. And we are praying for you.
when death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. His blood atoned. One final breath, and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For when the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn, what was made as the heavens rolled. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus. Lost, he crossed eternity. The King of Life was on the moon. For in a dark, cold tomb, where our Lord was laid, one miraculous breath. Join with all of heaven singing.